one. Hello, Jay Marshall, your Director of Career Services here at Elms, and what I want to talk to you about is the career fair, and I want to give you everything you need to be successful so that you can own the career fair. The career fair, as you know, is Thursday, November 3rd from 11 a.m. to 1.30. We have over 40 employers who've signed up. They're excited to meet with you. And so we're doing this to make sure that you have everything you need to be successful for this event. This is footage of my actual first career fair when I was a student. Now this was back before the discovery of fire. But my institution held a career fair. I went to it and I didn't know what to do. I don't want you to feel that way. I want you to feel like you've got everything you need, that you've got the tools in order to be successful at the event. Because you're amazing. And I want to make sure that employers realize all that you have to offer, what you can do for their company, for their internship site, for their job. And employers know it too. The response for this career fair has been the best I've ever seen. They really want to get to know you. They value what you have to offer. They value with what you've picked up from being at Elms College. They're impressed. We want you to have your moment to shine. So why should you want to be there? Because you can get your internship. We're committed to 100% of our students having some type of experiential learning opportunity. You may be required as a part of your major to complete an internship. Here's your opportunity to have 40 plus employers who you can talk to possibly about getting an internship. Remove some of that debt, take some of that pressure off of you to figure it out during the semester. It's also a chance to explore careers. I'll never forget, we actually had somebody who wanted to, who uh, was pursuing their doctorate in physical therapy at one of my previous institutions. They were spending something like 50 plus thousand dollars a year. And to get your DPT, you have to go to school for six years, and two of those are grad. So they went through six years paying over $50,000. It's got to be like $300,000 plus. Went out on their clinicals, came to realize that they couldn't stand touching other people. Do you know what physical therapists do all day long? They touch other people. They're moving them. They're sh shifting them. They're uh, treating something. And so $300,000 plus, and they had a doctorate in something they didn't want to do. That's one of the great things about career fairs is you can get more information, do your research to make sure you're in the right field for you, and then you don't end up $300,000 in the hole and furiously washing your hands and disinfecting it every five minutes at your job site. It's also the chance to find jobs and to network. Even if you're a first year student, if you're a sophomore, if you're a junior, even if you're a senior, you need to be able to build that network now so that they can feed you job opportunities. Everyone you meet at the career fair, ask for their business card, connect with them on LinkedIn. You never know who is the missing link to connect you to the person who can help you get a job. Also, just by attending, you will be entered into a drawing for a $75 gift card at the bookstore. That, I check, is good for any sweatshirt you could possibly want at the bookstore. If it's more than $75, I will chip in the extra. You will be able to get a nice sweatshirt if you win. Not every employer is going to like you and want to hire you, and that's okay. You're also not going to like every employer or even be interested in what they have to offer. That's just normal. What I do want you to know is that you can control what you can control. Right? You can't control if the employer is going to like you. You can't control global warming. You can't control what's happening politically in the world with the war and everything else. But you can control how you present yourself to the employer to make the best possible impression and compel them to consider you. And some of that has to do with how you dress, how you talk, how you have eye contact, all of those good things. So we're going to talk about that. Now, I want to make sure that you have a fair shot at this event. So we're going to talk a little bit about clothing. My look happens to be grocery store chic. Whenever I go into a grocery store, 
If this just happened last Friday, I walked into, this was actually a Walgreens, but the same thing applies. I walked down an aisle, saw someone, said hello. They immediately asked me where we had the bread. So I was like, uh, let me see if I can find it for you. And then after a few minutes, they were like, oh, wait a minute, you don't work here, do you? And I was like, no. Every time I go grocery shopping, people think I work there. They ask me what aisle something's in, if I can open up another cashier, uh, because you know the line's getting a little bit long. Uh, and they'll ask why we don't have paper bags anymore. You don't have to look like me. I have also been compared to the guy on um, Breaking Bad who owned the chicken restaurants. Uh, same color shirt. Same haircut, what are you gonna do? We actually had uh, a delegation uh, from another country come here over the summer, uh, better programs, and one of the delegation insisted I looked like somebody called Agent 47. Now I didn't know who that was, but I didn't know if that was a compliment, and to be honest with you, when I found out who Agent 47 is, I'm still not sure it was a compliment, but there you go. But employers study everything, it's all fair game. For the moment you walk in there, you're under, and you only get one chance to make a good first impression. Now, I have to see my niece and nephew in a few weeks. I don't actually like children, so this is usually how I approach it. And it usually gets me a couple hours at least. Uh, but when dressing to impress, what do I mean when I say dress to impress? That means no leggings, mohawk haircuts, nose rings, gauges, Underwear exposed, overalls, moo-moos, flip-flops, pajama bottoms. I actually held a career fair one time, and People's Bank will still never come to one of my career fairs because multiple students showed up wearing pajamas. Please don't come in pajamas. Um, it might have been because I was giving away a PlayStation as my grand prize, uh, and they just wanted the PlayStation, but that was not a good thing. Don't go with your friends. Like, you can go with your friends, but then split up. Don't be a pack going from employer to employer. That's a bad look. Um, I've had many career fairs, and folks would show up. I used to run them for the One Stop Career Center in Springfield, a big career fair that held at the basketball hall thing. And we would have candidates who would show up with baby strollers. And the problem with that is it sends a message to the employer that I don't have reliable child care. So if you can at all avoid uh, you know, have a babysitter for the event, that's great. Try to avoid wearing t-shirts. Never forget another one of my career fair. Uh, two different people showed up wearing Muppet t-shirts. Now, I love the Muppets. I actually have framed photos of two of the Muppets in my office, but I never wear a Muppet t-shirt to a career fair. Um, spandex, clubbing dresses, cut-off jean shorts. Good rule of thumb if you, uh, actually, I try not to use the expression rule of thumb. A good rule to live by, if you would wear it out clubbing, don't wear it to the career fair. I once met with a benefits guy at one of my places of employment. He showed up, he had a ripped shirt, it was, it was stained, he was unshaven, and he thought I was going to invest money with him. Everything is, maybe it shouldn't be, you know, maybe we should be able to look into the nature of one's heart and just be able to, but the reality is that everything is up for review. We want to establish confidence and credibility. Those are the two Muppets who I bring pictures of in my office. Uh, there are various categories of dress depending on the job. So generally for a job fair, you want to go professional. You can go business casual. I still prefer professional. Um, you don't want to go athletic casual and you don't want to go casual. Business casual, that would be khakis or slacks, maybe a tie, button-up shirts, polos, uh, conservative blouses, avoiding jeans. Uh, if you are wearing jeans, only dark wash only. I'm gonna be completely honest, I don't know what that means, but. Dress shoes, no sneakers. Much prefer a suit and a tie, button-up shirt and tie, uh, or for women, conservative blouses, dress shoes only, stick with black, maybe blue, gray, and brown, neutral colors. Uh, you always want to dress a level up from the job you want. You can never go wrong in the suit. You want to have a good trim set of lettuce. You want to be clean and shaved. If you have facial hair, it needs to be neat and tidy. Warm smile, feeling of confidence, and good body posture. The worst thing you can do at a career fair is walk up to your employer, making really firm eye contact with your shoes. Hi, my name's Jay. I'm feeling confident. 
A suit equals instant credibility. You can never go wrong with a suit. A suit, no matter how expensive, it's going to look bad if it's too tight or too loose. A couple years ago, there was a coach for the New York Giants. When he was introduced, he looked like he was wearing his dad's suit because it was like two sizes too big. And it didn't get better for him. He was fired within two years. Skirts should be no long, uh, no shorter, no shorter than the tips of your fingers. So figure that out on there. I'm going to get some dangerous territory for me because my knowledge of women's fashion is greatly limited. But you want it to have the skirts to at least be no shorter than the tips of your fingers. If you're buying suits or trousers off the rack and they don't fit perfectly, you may need to have them tailored. Um, I always like to give this example. This dog is actually wearing Tommy Hilfiger, but because it's unironed and too big, he looks sloppy and unprofessional. We want to avoid big jewelry or overly flashy clothing. Less is more when it comes to jewelry or perfume. I want the emphasis to be on you, your skills, your qualifications, not the bouquet that you're leaving that's going to be in the room four hours after you leave because you've completely spritzed yourself all over. Also, we don't want to show excessive amounts of skin. It sends the wrong message. We want to avoid bright colors. And remember, you can never go wrong with a nice tinfoil hat, especially if you want to block the signals the government is sending by radio waves. Plan out ahead what you're going to wear. I remember when I was in college, there would be a career fair, and I'd be like, oh yeah, I've got that suit, and pull it out of the laundry bag, shake it out. One of my proudest moments was when I had a powder blue suit that actually matched my powder blue car. That's hard to do. If you start building your wardrobe as a first year student, you won't have to buy it all at once when you graduate. It can be really expensive to put together a professional wardrobe, but if you start adding a little bit each year, um, around Christmas time, maybe ask mom and dad, hey, you know, I'm thinking a blazer, I'm thinking um, a suit, you can have a complete wardrobe by the time you graduate. We do have, and I want to put a shout out, over in Mary, Mary Julie Center in student affairs, they have the career closet, and they can, you know, if you're away from home, you don't have your best stuff here, um, they can provide you with the resources to look your best for Thursday. There's also Dress for Success uh, and Suit Up Springfield. Uh, also in your job fair guide, I've provided you with some non-binary options uh, and resources, four good resources for information about non-binary uh, professional clothing. Let's talk strategy. Before the job fair, one of the reasons why I'm giving you a complete list of everyone who's registered is I want you to spend some time, research the company, try to see what they're looking for, try to see what they're all about. Maybe look at their website, find out their company mission statement, value statement, any catchphrases. What does it seem to be they're trying to promote? What do they seem to be all about? And then you can actually tailor a resume to reflect those. See who's, ref uh, if you can, uh, actually you're not going to be able to see who's coming. Um, but maybe for future ones I'll do that and you'll actually be able to track them down on LinkedIn and find out a little bit about them. But come up with a game plan. You're only going to have so much time. Maybe you're going at 12.15 during your free period. So you've literally got an hour, maybe a little bit less, because you got to walk to class or get to the car or whatever. Maybe you want to grab a bite, too. Um, so figure out and prioritize what companies you actually want to talk to. And so don't waste your time with all of them, but prioritize your top five. If you have more time, your top 10 companies and try to have a really meaningful interaction with them. Um, now, I wouldn't go to your number one favorite first. I want you to warm up first. So start with one of the ones you're a little bit less excited about, just to get the butterflies out of your stomach, kind of get warmed up, and figure out what you don't want to say. Um, also, make sure your handshake profile is up to date. The other benefit of this is even after the career fair, if your handshake profile is up to date, employers may find you, depending on what settings you have, and offer you opportunities to apply for internships and other types of opportunities. Now, at the job fair, here's what they're going to be looking for. Your form. You know, how is your eye contact? How is your handshake? Is it firm? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. We're in the 
the COVID era, so I don't know if anyone's gonna even wanna shake hands. They may be doing the fist bump, they may be doing the, the elbow bump, they may just be doing the hey, or the thumbs up. Whatever they are comfortable with, follow with that. Uh, but if you do uh, shake hands, make sure it's a good firm handshake. Not so firm that they have to go to the ER and get a cast fitted for their hand, but firm enough to show that you're confident and personable. Eye contact, we want to have good direct eye contact. We're not gonna bore a hole through the back of their head, but make them know that we're paying attention to them and we're focused on them. And smile, just by smiling, you're releasing chemicals in your brain and in their brain that's gonna put everyone at ease and make it more likely that you're gonna hit it off. Now, I'm attached to this email uh, a link to the elevator pitch worksheet, uh, but basically it's the answer to tell me about yourself. You, know, you come up, this is what I did, and this is why I do this workshop. I came up and I'd be like, ah, so much better than people say, good afternoon, thank you for coming. I see that you're from Enterprise. I'm a management major. I'm really looking to connect with an employer that's gonna help me grow and develop as a professional. And I've heard so many amazing things about the, inter, uh, the um, enterprise management training program. You know, could you tell me what you're looking for in a candidate? Could you tell me a little bit about the process? Notice what I did there, I asked a question. And I told them a little bit about myself and then I led in with a question. Um, they're gonna be, Judging you on the elevator pitch, the presentation, your appearance, your appearance, how you carry yourself, your delivery, how smooth you gave it, the resume, questions asked, and your follow-up. They may say, sure, follow up with me in a week or so with an email or call me. If you do, you score major points. If you don't, they're not gonna think you're all that interested. Mints have saved many careers. You know, I definitely want to do that quick. Self check. I'm going to try to have some peppermints there just in case you did go extra garlic so you won't knock them out. Um, generally, when I have to resuscitate an employer because of a student's amount of garlic, uh, they don't get picked for the internship. So we're going to approach the booth, we're going to smile, extend your hand, introduce yourself. Let's jump back to number three, extending your hand. If they're kind of doing the whoa, that means they don't want to shake hands, that's fine. Um, introduce yourself, listen for their name. This is something I struggle with to this day is hearing the name and remembering the name. Give your pitch, ask a question, and listen to the answer. Now good open-ended questions you can ask an employer at a career fair include, what kind of positions are you recruiting for? What does your company value in applicants? What is the process for applying? What are the primary results your company would expect of the position? How long have you been with this company? How did you get your start with this company? Could you spare $50? No, that was a test. Listen to the answer. Showcase expressions that reflect interest. Don't look like you're in the middle of an accounting exam and you would really rather sever one of your limbs than spend another moment with them. Ask another open-ended question. Listen to the answer. You can always close with, what would the best next step be for me? And thank them for their time. You know, close like a pro. It was nice to meet you. Thank you for all this information. Have a great rest of your day. And then exit. Have a deep cleansing breath. Shake it off. And then pick your next employer to go to. If the employer does not have positions relevant to you, try to take a negative and turn it into a positive. Use it as a chance to practice. It can serve as a way to build your network. Would you happen to know any recruiters in my industry? Or what advice would you generally have for a recent graduate? And the amazing thing is, you should still follow up with that person, get their card, find them on LinkedIn, because we never know who the missing link is. You don't know who they know. Their brother could be the uh, hiring manager at Bay State and looking for nurses, and you're a nurse. A question or request for assistance, consider giving the person two options. An uh, amazing thing happens when we ask someone for help. Uh, it makes them think 
they like us. It's a little something called cognitive, cognitive dissonance. Your brain, or rather their brain, has a hard time keeping two ideas that they like you, then they must like you because they're, they're thinking of doing you a favor, and they don't know you or care about you or even like you. And so the, if you ask them for help, it may actually make them like you. And it makes it feel important. Make sure to get their business card and find them on LinkedIn. Follow-up. The difference between success and failure is usually the follow-up. Even if everything has not gone great, and you may not be the lead candidate, just by following up, you're progressing. Now, I talked a little bit before about an elevator pitch, and some of you were like, ah, what the heck is that? I usually like to start with a question. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about yourself. Guaranteed that the person I'm talking to will react like they're going into anaphylactic shock. That's because for most of them, they're answering the wrong question. They think I want to know their life story, their thoughts on the political situation. Um, when in reality, the elevator pitch is the answer to that question. And the best way to tell the answer, tell me about yourself, is with an elevator pitch. You know, the answer to the question, what are your strengths, is in the elevator pitch. Why do you want to work in this field? It's in the elevator pitch. How are you qualified for this job? All that goes into your elevator pitch. Why should I hire you? Elevator pitch. What is it you would really like me to know about you? So, your elevator pitch goes over what you have to offer. Now, right now, as a student, your college experience is probably the most important thing you have to offer this employer. Uh, I'm a junior student athlete. They love to hear that you're an athlete because that tells them that you know teamwork, you know time management, you have a certain amount of discipline and commitment, and you've got what one employer described far too often for my comfort, intestinal fortitude. And by that, he meant the ability to persevere through adversity. Now, you've probably lost some games when you've been here at Ellen's College, so how'd you deal with that? How did you show up the next day at practice and still give it your all? So, if you are a student athlete, definitely mention that. Uh, mention what your major is, and that you're looking to the next step in your career, and you're interested in opportunities in their industry. That's your elevator pitch. Um, it's not what you say to your higher power when you're trapped in an elevator. If you only had 30 seconds to market yourself, what would you say? What does that kind of remind you of? Hmm. The Elms Innovation Challenge. It's really the same thing. The difference is, is that you're the product. And so you're selling yourself in that pitch. It's like a well-crafted app. And so Forbes magazine has nine tips on elevator pitches. Clarify your target, put it on paper, format it, tailor the pitch to them, not to you. Try to keep the jargon out of it. Read it out loud. Practice, practice, practice. Prepare a few variations, and then nail it with confidence. It can take a little time to get it right. You're going to go through some versions. You're going to start to feel really uncomfortable talking to yourself in the mirror or in front of your iPhone, um, but it will really help. Make sure you tell them who you are. Make sure you explain your possible value proposition to them. It should educate and create interest. It should be 30 seconds or less conversational. Deliver it smoothly. Answer the question, why should I hire you and pay you lots of money? You know, an employer could be paying you sixty, eighty thousand dollars to start. That's a lot of money, but that's not all the money they're paying if they hire you. They also have to pay payroll taxes and all sorts of other expenditure. And the reality is, they're probably not going to get return on investment from hiring you for up to a year. They want to make sure that you're going to be worth that investment. So you've got to be convincing. But the elevator speech is the key to your interview, networking, cover letters, resume, even LinkedIn to unlock your career. Your job is to build the bridge between your skills and experience and what the employer needs and wants. Craft your pitch, hi, my name is Jay. I'm completing a 
business degree in accounting at Elms College with a minor in coaching. I'm interested in a career in accounting in this field. During my time in college, I've been on the women's softball team uh, and developed skills in leadership. Uh, I was voted a team captain. Um, over the summer, I worked part-time jobs, uh, doing some bookkeeping in a local firm. Could you tell me more about opportunities here at Moriarty and Primac? And with practice, remember, smiling, eye contact, open body, and confident posture. This is bad body posture. And also, it's probably really creeping out the person stuck in the elevator with them. This is more like it. With consistency, uh, words with essence. With consistency, continuity, creativity, and credibility, branding can be a powerful tool. I always think of Lowe's, let's build something together. You know, a DIY store, do it yourself. In four words, four words, they have a whole concept that, you know, for someone like me, who has absolutely no idea how to do home wiring, I can go over to Lowe's, walk down an aisle, and maybe there's a workshop going on, or maybe there's a couple of former contractors working there, and we're gonna figure it out. We're gonna build something together. You can kind of do the same thing for yourself. Uh, it doesn't have to be quite as slick, but if you can make it a memorable little phrase about yourself, and maybe something that they remember. And to be honest with you, something like a career fair is invaluable because we live today in a world of attack receptionists, voicemail, email, online applications. Actually getting face-to-face -face time with a decision maker is invaluable. You're not getting past her. Once you get the elevator pitch again, we're gonna ask those questions. Why do we love our dogs? Right? We come home after a terrible day, we just start talking to our dog about our problems, and they listen to us like we're revealing the secrets of the universe to them. Be like the dog. You know, steal a page from Dale Carnegie, who wrote the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And then he says, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get people interested in you. Make it about them. Next time you have a wedding to go to, right? First person you end up with, spend the evening asking them questions. And I guarantee, at the end of the night, they're gonna tell someone, you know, I really enjoyed talking to so-and-so. They're such a good conversationalist. But you made it about them. You let them do the talk. It's the same thing you can do at a career fair. Don't freak out. It's all about practice. Now, in a study, 30% of students felt they they had really nailed their elevator pitch, whereas 15% of employers felt the same way. And the big fails are bad eye contact, a weak handshake, lack of smile or energy, and no knowledge of the company. We live in the information age. You have your phone, you can Google. Thank you for your time. As always, my office is available to assist you, and I hope to see you at the career fair. Thank you.